Okay, uh, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to those of you who are present and also to those who are present online. Uh, today we will present uh, some of the contents of uh, this year's issue of Nordic Economic Policy Review, which deals with EU climate policy, as you can see on the screen here. And uh, my name is Harry Flam. I'm a co-editor of this issue together with uh, my colleague, Professor John Hustler. But first, I want to give the word to uh, the Minister for Financial Markets, Niklas Wiemann, please. He took the issue, so I wouldn't start reading it instead of giving the speech here. So, dear, dear ladies and, and gentlemen, dear Nordic friends, uh, so happy to be here with you this morning and this beautiful day in Stockholm as well. So those of you who are guests, I hope you feel most welcome and have some, some time over to, to enjoy our city as well. Uh, beliefs, feeling, intuition, values are, of course, crucial for, for all of us. Uh, when I woke up this morning, I didn't have to make a logical process for going out with my dog. I just knew that it was about time to go out with him uh, based on experience and based on my knowledge of dogs. And I guess many of you have, have the same problem every, every morning. Um, and beliefs, feelings, intuition and values are also, of course, important not only to do what to do, but also to do it in an efficient way. I mean, so many decisions to make every day. And if we need to do them with a with our calculus power in our minds, we would uh, be, be stopped already before breakfast uh, every morning. So uh, there's nothing wrong about, uh, about feelings or intuitions or, or, or values. They are, of course, necessary, but not sufficient tools to, to manage in, in everyday life and in policy, in, and in policy making. So uh, those are of great, um, great importance. Uh, but I had a teacher in uh, mathematical uh, statistics uh, who always said that uh, that intuition is the worst thing you can have. It's the, it's the most dangerous enemy when you when you deal with statistics and math. And uh, I know I guess many of you n know the very famous example. And he he told it I think almost every lesson actually when he had his his uh, ten minutes uh, argue on on intuition. If you do you, know, do you know how many people there must be in a room for a 50-50 chance uh, for, for a common birthday? And then he started, and, and since the evidence takes some minutes to go through, we, we, after a few lessons, knew it quite well, of course, that you need to be not uh, 365 divided by two, but you need to only be 23 people in the room to have a 50-50 chance of a birthday uh, in, in, in one day. And, um, uh, and this is... Uh, so important to stress in a situation like this because a discussion without facts and those days many people would argue that we have quite many discussions with only feelings value ideology and so on uh, but without the facts and sometimes facts are really difficult to to find or to to agree upon of course and that's why research and conferences like this is of crucial importance for for policy makings because intuitions and feelings and beliefs are very important in human life and in policy making but without facts uh, we are uh, we, we always risk to make really bad decision uh, for for the people that we are supposed to, to serve but even having the facts uh, is many times not enough because policy making and politics is often between it's sometimes about a bad choice and a good choice, but uh, quite often I find it's about two bad choices and uh, or two good choices. Uh, it's uh, really any. It's really when it comes to the to to the level of politics, it's not necessary to choose between bad and good. That's often already done. We have to choose between bad bad or good good. And then of course efficiency is also crucial. And it's really, really difficult to have feelings or intuition for efficiency, especially when it comes to complicated areas such as climate policy. So, so once again, uh, it's of utmost importance that everyone in the academic society within uh, policy making and, uh, and civil servants have, have tools for making both correct and efficient uh, decision. The Nordic Economic Policy Review is one of the most prominent publications uh, in our part of, of the world in, in this field. 
and it's of course an honor to to say welcome to to your and it's important to stress that it's also a platform like this for academia policymakers politicians to come together and to have discuss uh, to have discussions debate on those issues and to listen to insights from 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 others so i'm really happy to to be here and to take part of this uh, this issue this report and also to welcome many more uh, in in the, in the future uh, for us as policymakers, it's so extremely important to have access, dialogue, and to have uh, reports to read on uh, on topics that that are debated and discussed uh, uh, today. And this is, of course, a very timely report in a very important uh, issue. Uh, this focus uh, of this uh, this year's economic policy review is, as I said, both re both relevant and timely. Timely. We are uh, having the presidency in the European Union, as you know, and this is one of our main priorities uh, for, for a greener, uh, greener future. And energy and, uh, and green transition has been on the international political agenda at least since the end of 80s. Uh, uh, some people are quite surprised that it was Margaret Thatcher who really started to address uh, this issue at the, at the end of the 80s on an international level. Uh, and uh, she had a speak that could be held today, uh, I, maybe without even change, changing as much as a word, when she talked about this as a question for, for the planet, for mankind and so on, with, with words that we today perhaps normally would associate with, 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 uh, with, with, with other politicians. Sweden, uh, the Nordic and the European Union, is sometimes together front runners, and sometimes we in the Nordic countries are quite alone as front, front runners. And this fit, fit for 55 uh, is, of course, an important landmark, mark, both for us to continue our struggle to be the best, but also for other European countries to catch up, and hopefully and eventually the rest of the world as well. And I think this discussion we have here about leadership versus common rules is, of course, in the core of the question of what to do. So I'm really much looking forward to, to read uh, and to understand more and to join you also in the future for, for much of debate and discussion. And uh, once again, this hard work, it's really much hard work uh, to make such an issue. It's very appreciated. It's very important for us as policymakers and also come together like this, having discussion, having debates, uh, scrutinizing each other's arguments is of great importance, not only for the happiness of the mind, but also for the state of the world. So thank you so much for taking your time. And once again, welcome to Stockholm. Uh, before uh, going on to uh, one of the uh, papers in this issue, I was going to give you a quick refresher on uh, EU climate policy, but I see that the minister preceded me. <laughs> For those who uh, uh, perhaps are not fami so familiar with EU climate policy, first I, I want to say that uh, that uh, the EU now requires uh, member states to achieve a 55% uh, reduction of CO2 emissions by 2030 and to be climate neutral by 2050. Uh, the EU emission trading system is one part of the EU's climate uh, policies uh, that uh, try to achieve this, these two goals. Uh, and as you know, every year a fixed amount of uh, emission permits are auctioned off or given out for free. And this system covers about 50,000 industrial installations, air transport within the EU. And this is uh, equal to about 50% of total emissions. Now, as part of the negotiations now presented on the proposal by the Commission, ETS will be extended to shipping and air transport outside the EU by EU airlines. And the free allocation of permits will gradually decrease and the total amount of permits will be reduced and no new permits will be allocated after 2040. Uh, and a new emission trading system starting in 2000 uh, in 2026 will cover heating and cooling of buildings and road transportation. 
The second part is the effort sharing regulation. This uh, part covers uh, small industrial installations, agriculture and waste management. And until 2026, it also covers heating and cooling of buildings, which will then transfer to the new emission trading system, and maritime and road transportation. Uh, there, is a, there will be an EU-wide ceiling. There is an EU-wide ceiling and national targets, and that's why it's called an effort sharing for these sectors and national emissions allocations can be traded between EU countries and Norway and Iceland. The third part of uh, EU trade uh, climate policy is um, what's called LULUCF, uh, one of the many abbreviations, acronyms in EU terminology, which stands for land use, land use change and forestry. Agriculture and forestry is a net absorber uh, as a whole uh, for the EU of, of greenhouse gas emission. And emissions from agriculture consist mainly of methane and uh, nitric oxide, which is then translated into uh, CO2 uh, equivalents. Member states will be assigned national targets for this sector depending on their land mass and forestry. And I should also mention that uh, this sector is a net absorber in Finland and Sweden, although less so than we previously thought, apparently, according to very recent findings. And uh, Denmark is a net emitter. And finally, we have uh, a new instrument which will take effect in a few years, which we call the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM. Uh, this is to deter what, is, what we call carbon leakage, uh, which is uh, an effect of uh, higher costs of emissions in the EU causes relocation of production from the EU to non-EU countries. And it might increase imports of carbon-intensive products. Exporters to the EU will now have to buy permission permits at the same price as ETS permits for the corresponding product category. And this applies to, uh, at least at first, to heavy emitters of uh, carbon dioxide, which is iron and steel, aluminum, fertilizers, cement, hydrogen, electricity, and some and up and downstream uh, activities and free ETS permits will be phased out as CBAM is phased in. So now you know everything there is to know about EU climate policy and we can go on to the first uh, paper that we are going to present today, which is uh, uh, authored by uh, David von Bielo, Björn Kallén, Svante Mandel and Vincent Otto and uh, it's Svante and Björn who are going to be presenting the paper here today. Please Svante. Thank you very much. Works. Excellent. Um, thank you Harry, thank you all for having us. Uh, nice to be here. And as Harry said, this is joint work with David, Björn, Vincent and me, Vincent is here, Björn is here, um, and we're all at Conjunctiv Institute or the National Institute of Economic Research. Um, <clears throat> the idea here is that Sweden has long uh, been acting as a, a, a forerunner, been striving to act as a forerunner in, in, in climate policy. Uh, and as we heard, we got Fit for 55, EU is, uh, is strengthening their climate policy, so the EU is now sort of catching up with the Swedish targets. Uh, so this seems to be a good time to discuss sort of costs associated with, with the national, the Swedish national climate policy. Uh, relative to a uh, policy where we more align the Swedish policy to, to the EU's. 
And what drives this is that we could then exploit a series of flexibilities uh, in the EU climate policy that we sort of cannot do if we uh, keep the current Swedish target design. And to estimate these costs, we use a general equilibrium model, a CGE model uh, that covers Swedish economy. Let's uh, try to get an idea of, of, of uh, these costs. Um, well, Harry told us a bit about this. Uh, we've had since April two, one, uh, 2021, we got EU's new climate law stating that EU should be climate neutral by 2050 and also introducing the intermediate target for 2030 stating that the emissions should by 2030 be 55 percent less than in 1990 hence the fit for 55. Um, the fit for 55 proposal came after that um, and it was a com uh, proposal from the commission basically stating how to reach that climate law, the climate neutrality by 2050 and the 55% less by 1990. It says currently under negotiation, most of that negotiation is, uh, is finished by now. So, uh, and as a whole, I would say that the actual policy to come is by large uh, what was proposed in Fit for 55. You're not supposed to read this, but I think it's a good picture illustrating the size of the Fit for 55 package. There are a lot of proposals that, um, so mainly all of the EU's policy, uh, former policies are revised, strengthened, and there are also a, a, a few new things like the CBAM, uh, the new uh, EU, ETS for, for um, road transport and heating and small industries. Um, so a large package. And I guess we've, we've seen this, but the, the, the three parts of EU's climate policy relies on the EU ETS, energy intensive industries, aviation, uh, electricity production, the uh, Lulus EF, it is about uptakes, uh, and the ESR, which is the focus of what I will be talking about, um, which covers agriculture, um, uh, transportation, heating, and basically all emissions not covered by the ETS. The ETS will see a, a, a huge decrease in the number of permits to be allocated um, in the future, uh, meaning that that sets the emissions from that sector so they will be much lower than they were before. Um, we also introduce maritime in, will be included in the ETS and, and a couple of other things. Uh, the Lunar CEF, which will be a large issue for Sweden, which I will not talk much about today, is that we now introduce binding net targets for the member states. Um, so we, Sweden will need to increase their uptake due to this in most of forests. And then the ESR, which again will be focused on what I will be talking about. Uh, we will get lower quotas for the member states. The, 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 the total sort of uh, reductions needed to do by every member state is increased by this, except for Malta. Uh, for Sweden, this means that uh, formally, we should meet uh, minus 40 by 2030 compared to 2005, and now we should reduce our, our emissions by 50%, so quite a substantial increase. In, uh, and also we got these new ETS, which Harry was talking about, and those emissions will still be in the ESR, which makes the construction a bit complicated. We'll see how this that will work in the future. Okay, so that was very, very brief about the EU. And then Sweden has its own national targets. Um, so by 2045, as opposed to the EU's 2050, uh, Sweden has decided that the emissions 
from uh, well, the Swedish emissions, both from the ESR and the ETS sector, must be 85% less than they were in 1990, and the remaining 15% may then be compensated by something called supplementary measures that could be increased uptake in land and forests, for instance. Um, there are two intermediate targets, one for 2040, stating that the emissions by then should be 75% less than the 1990 levels. Uh, we've got a small part of that maybe achieved by supplementary mechanisms or measures. Um, what's up on the agenda at the moment is the 2030 targets, um, which is just a few years in the future. Um, where the national target states that ESR emissions must be 63% slower than they were in the 1990. Of this, 8% may be achieved by supplementary measures, and it seems that we're, we're going to use that option. So, uh, um, we're heading for uh, 50, minus 52, right? Um, there is this special target also for the transport sector, um, land-based aviation is in the ETS, so it's not covered by this. And that uh, transport sector target states that uh, emissions from that sector must be 70% lower than 2010, and there is no, there are no supplementary measures to reach that. Uh, that would be important, we'll come back to that. Uh, this is an illustration of the Swedish emissions in the ESR sector. We leave the ETS sector that's handled by, by, by um, emissions trading. Um, but this is the Swedish ESR sector from 2010 to, I think, 2019 is the last, or 2020. Uh, we see that emissions are decreasing. Good. Um, these are divided by gas. So the upper two parts, the dark blue and the light blue, are CO2. The darker ones are CO2 from transportation, covered by that transport sector target I was talking about. And the remaining are non-CO2 gases, mainly from the agricultural sector. Uh, there are a few things to note here. First, again, emissions are decreasing. We are moving in sort of the right direction. Uh, the upper darker blue again, they are transportation. If we are to reach the transport goal of minus 70 by 2030, we, the dark blue ones must be the lower dark blue one at 2030. That, that is the transport sector target. And one interesting thing is that if we manage to reach that, actually all other emissions could stay at the 2019 level. We don't have to do anything outside the transportation sector. Interesting observation. Um, also note that outside the transportation sector, more than half of the emissions are actually non-CO2 emissions. We have got basically no policy in place, or at least no economic policy in place, to handle those at the moment. Which makes it very difficult to, to in a short time at least, decrease them. Okay. Um, okay. At the moment, we, uh, the EU demands minus forty of us, and that will be increased to in minus fifty uh, compared to two thousand five levels. So, we, and the Swedish targets are ex, um, are compared to nineteen ninety levels. So we need to do some recalculations, and if we do that, we see that the Swedish target, uh, if we use full supplementary measures corresponds to minus 52. Minus 52% is basically the same as minus 50. There's no big difference between what EU demands of us after fit for 55 compared to our own national targets. Um, and also, if we include that we need to increase our uptake in the Lulu CF, basically that EU has catched up with the Swedish national targets. And given that, given that we've been a forerunner, so we had larger, so we, 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 we said that we want to do more in Sweden than what EU requires of Sweden. 
And now we're in a situation where EU, the EU requirements are basically the same as the Swedish national targets. This may be a good time to have a discussion about what to do, uh, because it doesn't really seem that we're that forerunner anymore, right? Um, so perhaps we could revise the targets. And again, what we are interested in here is that the Swedish targets are designed in a way so we cannot really use the flexibility that the EU policy provides for us. And just an example, uh, textbook economics. Uh, let's say that we look at, at our, our transport sector target again, uh, and say that QT on the left there is how much we must reduce uh, uh, emissions in, in um, the transportation sector, and the corresponding amount we have to do outside the, uh, the, the transportation sector is as much less. I would use a pointer, perhaps. Ah, skip it. <laughs> the idea would be that the last emission reduction we do in the transportation sector will cost you much more than the last emission reduction you do outside the transportation sector. So if we switch a little bit, we move that last emission from uh, uh, the last emission reduction from the transportation sector to outside the transportation sector, we could save a large cost. That last unit in the transportation sector was very costly. And increasing the reduction sort of outside it doesn't cost that much. So the idea would be that we could move emissions in emission reductions in the economy in a way that Total emissions are exactly the same as before, but total costs are much lower. And when we have a transportation target saying that we should do minus 70% in this sector, we can't do that. There's no flexibility. Basically, it's a, it's a similar story in the EU saying that it could be that the, Swedish, the last reduction we need to do in Sweden would cost us more than the last reduction they need to do in, say, Romania. And the EU policy framework provides a possibility to trade within these, meaning that we could actually um, buy a uh, reduction unit from Romania, so they will make a profit, and we don't have to do that very costly emission reduction in Sweden. And this is actually a good thing, because climate wouldn't mind, the emissions are exactly the same as before, but we could avoid the most costly reductions somewhere, perhaps in Sweden, and replace them by less costly ones in other nations. The Swedish target states that the emission reductions should be made in Sweden, so they sort of prohibit this trade. So, to give you some idea about the costs involved in the Swedish uh, policy. We used our CG model uh, and set up a couple of um, scenarios. We had a reference scenario using current policies. Um, we do not reach the target in that scenario. We, we were aiming for minus 63 here. And then we have four different setups um, one, A1, is where we simply increase the CO2 tax until we reach the target. Uh, A2 is that we reduce the uh, biofuel standards, which happened yesterday. Uh, and then, with the lower biofuel standards, we increase the tax until we reach the target. B is uh, switch to uh, the old system where we only had a CO2 tax on the fossil emissions. Um, take away a few of these subsidies, so we aim for one price for all CO2 emissions, one uniform price for all CO2 emissions in Sweden. And the last one is, okay, let's allow for trade between member states, so we're aiming for one CO2 price in all member states, what will happen? 
Um, this first one says something about what tax is needed to reach those targets. Uh, the first thing I should say that in the, the C option, where we can trade with other, uh, other member states, we simply assume. We have no clue at the moment on what the price of such trade would be. How much must we pay for an emission reduction from another country? Um, there's no, no such market at the moment. There's no price observations to be made. So we simply make an assumption saying 2,000 Swedish crowns per ton, basically twice the current price in the ETS. Out of the blue, remember that. If 2,000 tons, uh, Swedish crowns per ton would be correct, then our model says that, well, we will reduce the Swedish emissions by uh, 36%, and the remaining 27% to reach 63, which is the target we're aiming for, that will be made abroad and we will sort of buy that from, I don't know, Romania. Um, and all other scenarios, we, we, we reach minus 63 in Sweden, the Swedish target without supplementary emissions. I just want to note one thing that the A2, that is where we reduce the, the uh, biofuel standard and then increase the CO2 tax until we reach the target. Uh, that will require, require an enormously high CO2 tax. The reason being that the uh, biofuel standards sort of locks the blend in petrol and diesel. There are no incentives from the CO2 tax to increase the amount of biofuel in diesel. So you're stuck with, uh, I think there was 6% we agreed on yesterday, right? Uh, and then we have to, to, to reach the, the target, we need to increase the tax so much that people drive so little, so that the emissions drop to minus 63. And that, if we want to do it by increasing the CO2 tax, requires an enormously high CO2 tax. Probably not what we will see, because that will result in higher pump prices, which is opposite what we're after. Not going through all this, you, we can see in the top GDP, as expected, um, when we keep uh, when we go from A1 and A2, does not have a uniform CO2 price in Sweden. But when we go to B, then the all sectors within the ESR pay basically the same price for emissions, then GDP goes up. And if we also allow for trade with other nations, again assuming a price of 2,000 Swedish crowns per ton, then the GDP increase even more. This is what we would expect because we're moving to more and more and more an efficient climate policy. Basically, we see the same pattern for household consumption and similar patterns for basically all other sectors. Um, this is, I, I just, I, I thought this was fun. Uh, this is uh, the um, some uh, transport fuel prices. Uh, the percentage changes compared to the reference scenario. So if you're quick in your head, you can using the, you can calculate this. But what I'm after here is that, again, the A2 reduced the reduction split, the biofuel standards, and then try to, with that fuel containing a large amount of fossil, still trying to reach the target the prices for fuels must be extremely high so that you don't buy it, basically. You, 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 you have to be persuaded not to use your car, so it has to be very, very costly to use it, which is sort of counterintuitive to what we uh, would expect. So um, I think that's interesting. Uh, and then basically we see the same pattern in B, the, whole, the same CO2 price for all emitters in the in the um, 
CO2 emitters in ESR yields very much lower uh, pump prices than in A2. And if we again allow for trade with other countries under our assumptions, then actually we will decrease um, pump prices compared to 1990. Again, remember there's a very um, assumption lying behind that. So, to conclude this, uh, again, Sweden has sort of motivated its, its own climate policy with, with being a forerunner, uh, being an example for other countries to follow. And in many senses, we have been that. But now, EU, through the Fit for 55 package, is basically uh, catching up. And at the same time, there are substantially large gains uh, potentially large gains fra from sort of implementing a more uniform carbon pricing in Sweden, which, to be clear, means that, that the transport sector target is a problem here because that requires the very costly um, reductions to be made there. Uh, and also to use the fact that we are allowed to trade with other countries so we can have a more um, uniform carbon price over the entire EU, and I mean, these things could reduce costs without hurting the climate. The emissions will be the same, but the cost will be lower. lower. But to use that, we need to look at the Swedish national climate targets, how they are designed. And that's it. Okay. We have a few more minutes uh, for questions, if there are any. Um, Svante, having read the report and listened to you now, um, I'm a bit curious to know how you have treated electricity production costs and prices of electricity, and also the development of battery electric vehicles that are likely to replace fossil fuels uh, road vehicles in, in the next decade or, or so. Uh, I see little evidence of, of your assumptions and uh, I could imagine uh, that scarcity pricing might occur uh, since Sweden is expected to double its demand for electricity from an already very high level. Uh, the report says a lot about fuels, but little on electricity. Could you mm. comment on that? <coughs> Sorry. Well, first, uh, uh, electricity, in, at least in the reference case, follows uh, a scenario given to us by, by the Swedish Energy Agency. So we match that. But then it's, to some extent, in, endogenous to the model. So if, if we require more electricity, I believe, looking at Vincent, that the electricity price will increase. More, more, more interestingly, we also have made a, a quite substantial work with, with implementing electric vehicles. Um, and one thing that happens when, when we reduce the, the uh, biofuel standards um, so that the pump prices get lower, of course, then you get incentives to buy a petrol or diesel car because those are relatively less expensive um, and that's that, that that's in here so um, which is also reason for why you have to increase the tax so much in that scenario to counter the fact that the incentives tells you not to buy an electric vehicle but rather that um, so it, it's in there but uh, i do admit that um, it's not discussed that much in the paper we will we, we'll write other things about that but in the model. Questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So I just, if you want to go back to the the slide with the graph, I just had a. Um, this one. No, sorry, the, where you show total emissions in, in Sweden. Yeah, a bit um, sad, I thought. Um, <coughs> oh, 
You mean this one? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so then, just to clarify this, then the the light blue, like all the industry missions, are they in the? No, this is only ESR. Ah, this so, is only ESR. Yeah. Oh, okay. So right. so the the and there are industries in here, but they're small. The large share of industries are in the ETS, uh, all right. handled by the emission trading system uh, and not covered by the Swedish targets to 2030 or 2040. And that's yeah. why they're not here. Mm -hmm. And then I, because you said that Sweden has a target for 63% reduction for the ESR. Yeah. Is that like, um, was that existing before the ESR classification kind of came because I thought the ESR classification came now that that is new maybe um, th they will do changes um, well small no uh, the the ESR came or well, basically the ETS came in in 2005 before that there were emissions sort of and then they took the uh, energy intensive industry and electrification production, moved that out from the system, and what's remained became the ESR. The effort sharing uh, uh, regulation now agreement then, perhaps. Um, so this is basically what's not in the ETS. All emissions not in the ETS will end up in the effort sharing regulation. And the EU has a target for those emissions as a whole, and then they uh, s sort of distributes this effort in this, and and then Sweden has the the largest among some other countries. So we need to reduce them by fifty percent, and the Swedish target says minus sixty three, uh, but also that we can do it with some supplementary measures. And if we say that we do that, then it corresponds to minus fifty two. So almost the EU's. Okay. So then this is the six three percent is like recalculating the Swedish targets to to these uh, I mean what what one basic or... problem when discussing this is that the Swedish targets are expressed towards uh, compared to nineteen ninety levels and the EU targets are uh, relative to two thousand five emissions. So that's just to confuse us all, I guess. Okay. 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 Uh, thank you. Yeah. Could, uh, I have a question about the, uh, you're saying that um, the Swedish national targets need to be redesigned. Could you, if you could elaborate in what way? Because they were ambitious when they were set and we know they're not in line with the Paris Agreement. So compared to, and, and the need for being forerunners, you, you see this from a very narrow cost uh, efficient perspective could you elaborate a bit about how to reach the uh, the targets in the paris agreement uh, uh, really what, what i'm saying is that when we decided on these targets in 2017 uh, they were ambitious compared to for instance what eu required of us now eu requires basically the same as our national targets so the national targets aren't that forerunnery anymore uh, so we, uh, I think, and we don't have to change the targets. We can keep the targets, but they, they, they don't really make any sense anymore. They, they're basically the same impact as if we just did what the EU tells us to do. Uh, and then, I mean, it's up to the politicians. Perhaps we should uh, we should may, uh, take new targets, which are even more stringent, continue being a forerunner, uh, and there may be benefits with that. There are also costs. But there may be benefits, and perhaps they are. We don't really know. Uh, if we want to use the flexibilities provided by the EU, uh, then we could change the target such that we could do that. Um, the climate wouldn't mind, because the EU requires basically the same as of, of us that we, our national target says. So there would be basically no difference for the climate, but the cost will decrease. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not arguing that, I'm, I'm just saying that keeping the Swedish targets at the moment seems a bit strange because we're, they're, they're not more ambitious than uh, what the EU requires. So, it's hard to say that we are those forerunners, which we actually were 
a few years ago. If that's how you define it. So either way, this is a good time to have a discussion about the Swedish targets. Could you say something about the relation between this and Paris Agreement? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could say I could say that, that, that Sweden has no national um, target sort of under the Paris Agreement. The EU is the unit under the Paris Agreement. Uh, but it's very difficult to say that, well, if we, we do this, then we're in line with the Paris Agreement, or we don't do this, then we're not in line. It, it's, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can add, the, the EU legislation is the translation of the EU commitment to the Paris Agreement in, in, in uh, Union legislation. So in that sense, it, it relates to the Paris Agreement, but one can question whether this, the EU commitment is perfectly in line with the Paris Agreement, of course. Well, I think there are um, scientists saying that it's not in line with the Paris Agreement, also that the Swedish targets should be more ambitious to be in line, uh, more in line with the Paris Agreement. So that could be elaborated on. Um, do you want to respond or? Because we, we, we come back to that the EU has, what's it called? It's a national determined NDC, NDC contribution. Uh, so we've stated towards the Paris Agreement that this is what the EU should do, and then we have Fit for 55 and the climate law, and, and that is how the EU fulfills its requirement towards the Paris Agreement. And Sweden is, in this case, in this instance, just a part of EU, which then. If, if I understand the discussion among scientists on, on this issue, uh, I think man must make a distinction between different commitments within the Paris Agreement. Uh, so, so, um, so the, one of the benefits with with a regulation under Fit for 55 is that we get uh, a clear control over total CO2 emissions, not methane and, and NOx, but the ones in there. And if you calculate, and so you can calculate how much emissions is going to happen. Uh, and, and uh, it seems pretty clear that if everyone has the same limits as EU, we are close to the carbon budget for one and a half degrees and far below that for two degrees. But then there are other commitments in the Paris Agreement. So, so the richer countries in the world are responsible for uh, helping the world become climate neutral. And how that should be done is a discussion among scientists where some argue that we are not doing what's required and that we should take this responsibility by going faster in the EU. And others say that that doesn't seem reasonable. In, in addition to what John just said, it might be interesting to note that environmentalists have taken governments to court in three European countries claiming that they don't live up to their Paris commitments. And that is national governments rather than the EU. I don't understand the legal the, the, the situation, but, but they seem to claim that it is the national government that is responsible. I do not dare to comment on that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Svante. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Professor Michael Huell from the University of Oslo, who has written this paper with Rolf Golombek, who is uh, a researcher at the Frisch Institute. Please. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So let me start, let me first see if I can figure out the technology. Um, I, I can click here, I guess. Yeah. Oh, one. yeah, this one. Right. Okay, let me start by uh, telling a little bit about Norway. Norway is a very different country compared with most European countries and most countries in the world, in particular in two uh, areas. 
First, Norway has a very large offshore petroleum sector, making up, standing for, uh, in 2021, 21% uh, of GDP. Actually, even much higher than that last year because of the extremely high uh, natural gas prices. And this sector accounts for a large part of GDP, but also the mainland Norwegian economy is also very closely linked because there's lots of uh, industries supplying both investment goods and intermediate inputs into this sector. The second feature of Norway is that we already have, unlike most countries, we have 90%, uh, sorry, 99% uh, renewable energy. Elect uh, electric energy is 99% renewables mostly 91% hydro on the rest wind. So clearly these two features are important also for CO2 emissions from Norway and the, compared with other countries. So I hope this table is, is readable. Um, let's see, I can try to point. So this is, is, is this the pointer? Oh, okay. That's okay. I, perhaps I can do this. There you go. Almost 25% of the uh, total uh, CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions comes from the petroleum sector. This is the natural gas used to on, on the platforms to uh, get the energy to pump up the oil and gas. So that's one, uh, one feature. And if you go down the table, you see that uh, transportation, both road traffic and other transportation is important uh, contributor to uh, the total greenhouse gas emissions. And, uh, and also, you see that there's virtually no emissions from electricity production, unlike most countries. And finally, and that's quite, I think, quite similar to at least Sweden, agriculture, uh, emissions from agriculture are, are large, 10, almost 10% of the total. In our article, we don't talk about those emissions because they're non-CO2, and that's totally different types of policies required for those emissions than others, so we simply ignore those, but it is important for the overall emissions. So um, our article is uh, three, divided into three parts. First, a very brief uh, overview of the economic, relevant economic theory. Second, we look at policies and goals in the short term towards 2030. And then thirdly, we we discuss somewhat uh, what sort of structural changes in the Norwegian economy might we expect towards uh, 2050 and beyond, given that this is going to be a more or less carbon neutral society. So starting with uh, theory, it's, uh, uh, I think all economists would agree that uh, a price on carbon emissions should be the, uh, at least a very important uh, policy instrument. And if you look at a economics 101 textbook, they'll say that uh, a tax of this type, a price on emissions, which is a special case of a, a tax on some negative environmental externality, that should, that's the only, only policy. If you have that at an appropriate level, you're fine. The rest you can leave to the market. Uh, in reality, is of course, not quite so simple. There are uh, there could be good, there's many bad reasons for supplementary policies, but there are some good reasons as well. One is the distributional considerations. Uh, usually when one talks about distributional considerations, one thinks about high income versus low income. Uh, that, in my opinion, is not so relevant because if you increase the carbon tax, you get government revenue and the total distributional effects depends completely on how this is re recycled back if you could recycle all of it back to low-income households, then clearly the distributional effect is very different from giving it in a more general tax cut, same percent to everyone. Having said that, I think no matter how uh, the revenues from the carbon tax is used, it's still the case that people perceive the tax as a direct cost. The, reimbursement that they have lower taxes than they otherwise would have had is much more invisible. So it's easy you get a political opposition against high and in particular ra rapidly rising uh, government taxes. But there is one distributional consideration that you're not going to get around no matter what, because no matter how you redistribute the tax revenue, there's always going to be some households are heterogeneous. Some have either due to preferences or historical investments, they have much higher 
carbon emissions than others. For instance, if you live in a large house or live have a long commuting distance are two examples. And clearly there's going to be oppositions from, from those groups. For them, if an, an alternative to, to uh, uh, the tax would be some sort of subsidy to, uh, to an alternative to, to uh, carbon energy. That is also costly, but the costs are distributed in a different way. Now, partly because whatever a high tax and especially a rapidly rising tax is going to be met by some stuff, it's going to be controversial. Partly because of that, or independent of that, in one way, governments cannot really commit to future carbon, uh, future carbon prices. And given if it, present taxes are controversial, investors are not going to know really what the carbon price is going to be in 10 or 20, 30 years time. And for many major changes, if you're rapidly going to reduce carbon emissions, this requires large and long-term investments. And if the government, can, and if the prices of carbon emissions are uncertain, then the profitability of these investments are also uncertain. So this might require uh, additional instruments. And finally, there's other externalities and market failures. Just a, in the paper, we just discuss a couple. Uh, technology development is one. A uh, second one is uh, is um, coordination issues, especially when establishing new markets. There is a there could be a coordination issue. Uh, one example is purchase. Uh, nobody's going to purchase an electric car if there's no charging stations, and nobody's going to build a charging station if they don't expect people to buy electric cars. So those. That's just one obvious example of a coordination issue, which might require some kind of government policy. So there are, there are reasons for additional instruments. However, it's not the case that the more instruments one use, the better. Each additional instrument, in addition to some pricing of carbon emissions, should, have a, 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 should be justified from some, uh, with a good reason. OK, so let me now go through Norwe Norwegian uh, climate goals and ambitions. And the most important is obviously uh, the Paris Agreement, which Norway is obviously has, uh, is part of. Like Sweden, however, Norway's uh, commitment to the Paris Agreement goes via the EU. Although Norway is not a member of the EU, for all the, these climate issues, Norway is, in, for all practical purposes, a member. So, uh, so Norway's, uh, Norway's uh, commitment to the Paris Agreement is just like Sweden's. It's part of, uh, it, it's part of the, it's, it's, a, it's a deal that Norway has with the EU. So that's the second one, agreement with the EU. And that's first, that's a threefold agreement. First, we participate in the EU ETS. Uh, and second, there's a, uh, we have a specific commitment for non-ETS emissions. And Presently, those, those, uh, that commitment is reducing uh, our emissions by 40% towards 2030. And I never can remember the base year, but uh, whatever, it's 40%. And it's a, a linear reduction. We have an agreement year by year that we have to have. If we don't, that, that, that we can't violate. However, also there, these emissions are part of the effort sharing regulation. So Norway has some flexibility also there. And finally, we have an agreement with the uh, EU on a specific commitment on Lulu, Lulu CF land use, land use change and forestry. Again, I'm not going to talk about that. That requires totally different policies than the CO2 emissions or the, no, the CO2 e emissions from uh, transportation industry, etc. Norway also has a climate, uh, climate change act. Uh, which is uh, mostly a long run towards 2050, we should have at least 90% reduction of CO2 emissions uh, compared with 1990. But also in this act explicitly says that this can be seen in cooperation with other EU countries. So it's not necessarily fixing emissions from the Norwegian territory. And then the two last, the so-called Hurdals platform, Hurdal is a place in Norway, that's the present government. Um, there, there, uh, there is a commitment to reduce total emissions by 55% uh, by 2030 compared with 1990. So it's a commitment on total emissions, ETS plus non-ETS. 
So that's very different from the from the agreement we have with the EU. And I'll return to that uh, a little bit later. And then the various municipalities, sectors, etc., have specific goals. Uh, one example is that all new cars should be emission-free by 2025. That's a, a goal uh, we have in Norway. That's uh, much earlier than I think we have a similar uh, ambition in the EU, but I think its Norwegian ambition is about 10 years earlier, as far as I can remember. And the second one, very, and this is very important, that is a particular goal for the offshore petroleum industry to reduce its uh, emissions by 50% from 2005 to 2030. And I'll return to discussing that afterwards. Okay, what about policies in Norway? Well, first in the, e the ETS, there's a quota price, which is a currently approximately 100 euro. In addition, for two of the sectors within the ETS, that's uh, there are specific carbon taxes in addition to the quota price, and that's um, the the petroleum sector and the domestic aviation. Both of these have additional taxes. For the non-ETS, the current price uh, CO2 tax in Norway is 952 kroner, and that was uh, about 90 euro some months ago when we wrote this, but the exchange rate for the Norwegian kroner has sort of gone down the hill after that, so after all these numbers have to be recalculated somewhat. Um, and this is planned, and that parliament has agreed to that, but in real terms this should approximately double by, by 2030. So this is a sort of semi-commitment, but it's not a commitment that if, if I was going to invest in something which really depended on this doubling happened, I would obviously be uncertain, will this happen or will there be a policy change? And Norbus had a, a, a specific policy for electric cars. They've been heavily subsidized both directly and indirectly. We discussed some of that in more detail in the article. And this policy has been very successful in the sense of the share of electric cars. 79% of all new private cars were electric in, 90, in 2022. I think that's more than any other country in the world. But that's, we don't have a goal really on the number of electric cars. If you think of how much CO2 emissions is from it, you have to ask, are these more people buying car number two and using them instead of taking the bus? These electric cars have special rules for being able to drive in the, in the bus lanes, things like that. So it's not so easy to know exactly how much CO2 emissions have gone down due to this. But certainly they have gone down. We don't know how much. They've gone down. CO2 emissions in Norway have certainly gone down due to the large share of electric cars. They would have been higher otherwise. I, I think that's reasonably uh, safe to say. However, if you look at the emissions within the whole of Europe, it's not so obvious. Because Europe has a has a mandatory emission reduction targets for all new private cars, so so many grams of CO two per kilometer. Now, if this if this um, uh, emission target is binding, then subsidizing electric cars and getting more electric cars simply means it's easier for to achieve this binding target, and it won't necessarily uh, change the average CO two from all cars. So. Seeing in light of the EU uh, rules, it's not so obvious that uh, Norwegian policies directed to climate cars are reducing emissions in the total EU plus Norway. And in particular, if the new if transport sector is included in EU's new quota system and Norway participates in that, like we do it with the uh, EU EDS then it's really going to be difficult to justify the present Norwegian policy of subsidizing electric cars. And it should be said that Norway is gradually phasing out the, the subsidies and benefits to electric cars. So, so in that respect, we're going in the right direction. It might have been smart to do that previously, but it's about time to sort of relax these policies. Offshore petroleum, Norway has a CO2 tax of about, uh, or, or the, CO, the quota price, price plus the specific tax is about 170 euro per ton of CO2. In spite of this, most platforms, it's more profitable to burn gas and produce energy in that way, instead of uh, having electricity cables from mainland and, and uh, electrifying these. However, this is a policy in Norway that we want to uh, electrify several of the platforms. Um, 
it's not obvious what the effect of this is, however. Certainly, it is going to reduce emissions from Norwegian territory because uh, we, because this gas, which otherwise is burnt on the platform, is no longer burnt. We use electricity. On the one hand, though, this gas isn't going to just disappear. It's, it means there's going to be more gas to be exported since they're not burnt on the platform. That's going to be burnt somewhere in Europe. That's one effect of it. Second, electricity production uh, or electricity in Norway is closely linked to electricity in the rest of the Europe. So increased electricity use in Norway means more, given the current electricity mix in Europe, this is going to be more emissions from that. So it's not really obvious uh, yeah, from uh, what the net effect of this is going to be on Euro European CO2 emissions. And, take, and then adding into this that both the electricity sector and the offshore petroleum sector is part of the EU ETS, it's not obvious at all if this is going to really be a policy that reduces European-wide emissions. Uh, having said that, this specific target for the offshore petroleum sector with electrification, if this is actually necessary given, or more or less necessary, given this goal of the total emissions from Norway should be reduced by so, so much, that was I call from the Hurdals platform. So given that goal that you're sort of focusing on, on total emissions and, and not distinguishing between ETS and non-ETS, then it's difficult to see how Norway can achieve that without this uh, mandatory electrification. So our summary of the policies towards 2030 is that we should really carefully consider having goals and policies directed towards the EU ETS, which one has to have if you have this total emission cap. And in, in addition to the, the effect or, or lack of effect on total EU emissions, the whole idea, if, if Norway and other countries starts having policies directed towards sectors in the EU ETS, we're undermining the whole idea behind the, uh, the ETS. The whole idea behind the ETS is to have a common cap. It's the total emissions from the EU which are important from, for the climate. So we have a total cap, and then we leave to the market to find the most efficient, cost-efficient way to achieve that cap. If you start meddling around and doing sector-specific policies directed to ETS sectors, you're undermining the whole idea of the ETS. Okay, so that is uh, that is just what I said. It's, it, this this electrification it might be profitable in the long run, with uh, with higher quota prices and and less CO two or less CO two emissions in in the energy mix from Europe. But forcing this rapidly towards two thousand and thirty seems to be a very uh, wrong policy. Okay, so how much time have I used? Okay, so, so so turning now to the second part of the paper, that uh, takes up at least half of the, uh, the written article, but we're not going to use as much time here. Uh, this is the sort of transition to a low carbon society, sort of looking at towards 2050 and beyond. Obviously, some when you have a rapid transition from uh, from a carbon or quite a carbon intensive society into a Non, uh, uh, low carbon society are going to have a lot of structural changes in the economy. So what sh role should the state uh, have in this? And the, there are basically two views. One is the, what we in our article call the neoclassical state. And that is that the role of the state is to correct well-defined market failures without sector specific policies. And then the market determines which sectors which will grow and which will decline. And the second view is more a sort of proactive state which is based on a less confidence in markets and various policies to support specific industries and sectors that the state expects to be profitable in the long run. And that's often what economists, economists criticize calling picking winners. And the present government leans at least more to the second of these than the previous government. Uh, how much it is in, uh, in words and how much in reality remains partly to be seen, but already you see some sector specific uh, support systems. So the present government has sort of identified some sectors that I think are going to be important in the future. And let me just list them up and then very briefly discuss them. Uh, these are the sectors discussed in, in our uh, article. Petroleum extraction, I'm not going to say anything more about that. 
CCS, carbon capture and storage, production of hydrogen, offshore wind power, and batteries. And for all of these, uh, an obvious question to ask is, does Norway have a comparative advantage? And second, it, probably if, if there's a no to that, that, that should be no more <laughs> question, but if there's a yes, is there a justification for uh, government support? So if we start by looking at CCS, carbon capture and storage, Norway probably does has, have a, uh, an advantage, partly due to we have the storage um, facility, uh, the geolo geological structures for storage facilities, and there's a large offshore competence in Norway, which probably can uh, be used in the in CCS. And in fact, here Norway has already, the government has committed to making the storage facility outside of the West Coast. Uh, and uh, uh, one justification for such a government uh, support is, of course, the coordination problem again, because nobody's going to start capturing carbon if there's nowhere to place this carbon, and nobody's going to build a, a carbon storage site if they don't think this, if, if they don't believe there's going to be a market for this. So this government uh, active government policy in this case, I think, can be justified in a startup phase. Hydrogen can be produced in many ways. For the relevant in a low carbon society is two ways, so-called what one calls blue hydrogen, which is pro uh, produced from natural gas in combination with uh, CCS. So you capture the carbon, so it's a carbon-free hydrogen. And the second is so-called green hydrogen, which is made from electrolysis using electric energy to make hydrogen from water. So again, does Norway have a competitive advantage? Well, probably due to our availability of natural gas, since for reasonable uh, assumptions about natural gas prices and electricity prices, it seems that so-called blue hydrogen is much less costly than green hydrogen. So Norway has a comparative advantage, but it's not clear at all what is the future market for hydrogen looks like. Some argue that it's going to be a very important market. Others say that this is not going to play a, be a, a, ever going to be an important uh, energy carrier. So it's certainly uncertain. So, um, so there is not obvious justification for the government to support this, but, uh, but of course, blue hydrogen is closely linked to this, the whole issue of CCS, which I did argue that Norway could play a role. Does, or, does Norway have a competitive advantage in offshore window, wind power? Not obvious, but high competence in offshore activities that tends to uh, perhaps give Norway a competitive, or, sorry, a comparative advantage. But it's, that even so, it's not so easy to find a good reason for government support. Electricity is a well-defined market. There are, uh, it's unlike hydrogen and, and uh, CCS, where these are new markets. This is a market for electricity, which is a well-established market, and it's not clear that we need any kind of government intervention. And finally, batteries, which some, which the Norwegian government thinks is is uh, is a good green industry, and it might very well be true that battery production is, and or the, the demand for batteries in Europe and the world is going to increase uh, significantly over the next decades. But does Norway have a, a comparative advantage? Uh, I'm not so sure. I don't really see what that should be, and it, also it's difficult to find a good justification, as far as I can see. So to sum up, scaling up of, of green, new green industries in Norway should be based on sound economic principles. Uh, and we, yeah, I guess I've uh, already, that's just a repetition. Some of these sectors such as the government has pointed out as sort of promising uh, future sectors do probably have comparative advantage, but for battery production, I'm not so sure. So I think that's it. Thank you. Yes, sure. Mm. Okay, uh, the floor is open for questions. Yeah, I have a question regarding the comparative advantage in these green industries. Is there one technology or are there a few technologies for which you Norwegians do a lot of the innovation yourself? Such that you could argue that there might be knowledge developers and you can support those green industries on those grounds? Uh, sorry, I, I, I didn't, could you just say the first the first part of your sentence? What was that? That we should 
if, the, if you have any of the green industries in Norway where you do a lot of the innovation yourself, mm. where the Norwegians are leading in terms of innovation? Mm. Well, I think, if anything, it's the whole uh, uh, supply indus industry for the offshore. I think that's here Norway has very high international competence. And to the extent that, so, so that's why I said CCS, hydrogen, offshore wind power, those are technologies or, or systems uh, value chains that Norway has very good expertise in. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very uh, impressive and encouraging uh, figures on uh, the development on, on uh, electric cars. Do you have any figures or, or facts on the development on heavy trucks, uh, electrification of heavy trucks? Thank you. Uh, and for short answer, no, I don't have it. <laughs> you can find it somewhere, but I don't have it. And I think there's that's it's private cars and small vehicles which are electrified, mostly. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question on the on the environmental cost of electrification of the of mm. the fleet in Norway. Mm. Uh, have you accounted for the? I mean, there's a scrapping scheme at the same time that happens. I guess there are lots of cars uh, which are not used anymore, and this potentially has a cost. Has it been evaluated? The cost of the cars not used? Yes, not used anymore. Uh, the one which are not. No, I think I think this is just it's the new cars. I don't think it's been an increasing scrapping of uh, of cars. I think it's simply when cars in any case are scrapped and you get new cars into the market you get electric cars so the the total fleet of electric cars is nothing close to this 79 percent this is the new cars that are purchased so it takes a very long time even with 100 percent of the new cars being electric you have to wait 15 years or something to get like 90 percent of the, the fleet of cars to be electric Oops, Uh, so can you tell us how the uh, rollout of charging stations for electric vehicles, how, how that has worked? That's, it seems to be a big issue in Sweden that uh, many people complain that it's difficult to go up to the countryside. So. Mm. That has increased rapidly in Norway and I frankly I think this is uh, market driven. So uh, th what the, the, uh, the, the government and local governments have supported these sort of um, more sort of uh, slow uh, charging stations in towns and municipalities but the the rapid charging stations along the highways they're totally market-based and private and they have increased a lot but even and, and if you drive on a monday morning like a person like me can do because i'm retired then you the huge capacity you can choose among if on a Friday afternoon on the way to your cabin, that's, I've heard stories of people having stand for an hour in line to charge their cars. Uh, so I guess that's the answer. But that, that seems to work because of the, so that's a justification, of course, for the, uh, which has been for the early subsidizing of the electric cars because, and, and then when, when they, it was very clear that there was going to be a large growth in the electric cars, it was commercially profitable to establish charging stations. I was just curious when you talk about um, uh, the oil production in Norway, how much of uh, Norwegian oil is exported to the EU and hence, up, hence ends up within the EU uh, as a problem in terms of EU emissions? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the, the oil, but uh, because Norway is partly oil but partly gas. So oil is an international market and you never know where oil ends up. So that's just simply a world market. But the natural gas is the answer is almost all goes to Europe. We don't we don't export anything on or virtually nothing. So it's all going to Europe. Hmm. If there are no more questions, we thank you, Michael, for your presentation. And <clears throat> Uh, we will <coughs> make a recess for coffee, a coffee break, until uh, 45, quarter to 11.
when we reassemble here for a panel discussion. So please enjoy your coffee.
uh, conference. Uh, so the starting point for the uh, that Harry and I had when we uh, sent out the call for papers to this region uh, to to this conference was that there is a pretty clear support for uh, the Nordic countries being forerunners in climate policy. But we also see that lots of things is now happening in uh, the European Union. And that really should uh, uh, be taken into account when we think about how we can become uh, and continue to be forerunners in the climate policy area. So, so the, uh, and we want to end with the discussion on these issues. Are, uh, are we forerunners? Should we be forerunners? In what way should we be forerunners? Is, is the only way to be forerunner, forerunner to have a tighter national emission target or is it something else that we can do? So that's the kind of issues that I would like to discuss or, or rather hear our panelists discuss today. So we are very glad to have uh, three uh, very prominent people to discuss these issues. And the first is Jytte Guteland. Please come up. <coughs> so Jytte, Jytte I, I suppose everyone knows, uh, she uh, is now a member of the Swedish Parliament. She used to be a member of the European Parliament and was there uh, instrumental for actually the things that we are now talking about, the climate law in particular, but also the reforms of the EU ETS. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting to hear what you have to say. We have Per Kågeson. Uh, per Kågeson for Swedes don't need uh, any, any introduction. And it actually would be very difficult to give an introduction and presentation of you. You've been with me for all my conscience, li conscience life. So I, I guess I read the first book of you 50 years ago or something like that. And <laughs> since then it's been continuing. And you're still very active in the Swedish policy discussion. Uh, and lastly, uh, Svante Mandel, who you already heard. Svante uh, is head of, the, as you heard, the, uh, I don't know exactly what it's called, but uh, the division at the Kointur Institute, the National Institute of, of Economic Research, uh, that deals with uh, climate and environmental issues. You used to be a researcher at uh, VTI, and also Stockholm University, I think, where I am. So, so I'm going to let the panel start with uh, a few minutes, five minutes each. Jutte. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving me the privilege to take part in this discussion and uh, be part of this excellent panel. Um, I come from, um, uh, I think, uh, in this uh, dialogue, I will. I will uh, have the main focus on my previous uh, job uh, as a member of the European Parliament. Uh, I was a member of the European Parliament since 2014 until uh, September last year. And uh, I was um, uh, working in the ENVI committee, so I worked mainly with environmental health and climate issues. Uh, and uh, I had, um, sorry, as Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> okay, this is better. That's true. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I was a member of the European Parliament during uh, eight years, and I had the privilege to work with the climate legislation. So I worked with the climate law as the rapporteur, and I also worked with Fit for 55, uh, some of the main uh, legislative proposals there, e mainly ETS uh, reform. And I did that also for two uh, two times. I had the privilege of being the shadow rapporteur, so I was responsible for my political group for the ETS uh, two times. Both the first mandate uh, from uh, the five years after the election to 2014, and then also after uh, after the Ursula von der Leyen uh, Commission. And um, I, I, I would like to say that I think it was like night and day to work with climate uh, proposals, uh, my first mandate and my second one. The first time we were always the, the late birds in the debate. <laughs> we, we were coming out 
the, at the latest, um, uh, often in the evening and in the night. And me, I had a baby during that period, uh, so I often actually had him with me in the debate. So you can see it literally by looking at some of the uh, streamed debates from the European Parliament. You can see that I often was accompanied by my, my little son. And that was because environmental and climate proposals were not that hot. Uh, so when all the other people had left the building, the other um, politicians, journalists, everyone except we in Envy, we were still there working with climate proposals. Not all of Europe were thinking that we were not that hot. We were lobbied. We had lots of industry actors uh, following our work. But actually, in the debate, uh, we were not uh, the, the big stars. So uh, I often found, found that a bit frustrating to be working with so important legislation and not having uh, attention around it. And I think for the climate proposals, it was also not giving the results that we would have wished for. But I am proud from that first mandate that we did do some tool improvement of the ETS. Uh, it was really a much more lame uh, directive uh, before that reform. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but people talked about it, that uh, the industry could buy uh, um, the um, one ton, a million ton uh, CO2 equivalent uh, for five euro. Uh, and in the end of that uh, mandate, it was actually 80 euro. So it was a, a big improvement, actually, uh, but still not enough. And then I would like to come to and conclude my uh, very short introduction by the second term from 2019. Then suddenly climate and uh, the climate legislation was the hot thing. So everyone wanted to be in envy, so we had to fight. And I was lucky because I had already been there. Uh, so I, I got the privilege of being uh, my group's coordinator, so I was the group leader for my group, and I also got the privilege to actually be rapporteur for the climate law. And we had much easier to, to be progressive during the second term, because the election 2019 was a big shift. And the big shift, I think many of you know it, uh, but that was um, definitely the Paris Agreement and the IPCC reports that had been presented during the first uh, pe period I mentioned, but also Greta Thunberg and Friday for Future movement and the attention among uh, in all our member states. So during the second term, the, commission, the Ursula von der Leyen Commission had to do more. And uh, she and her commission presented the Green Deal, the climate law, and also the, uh, the Fit for 55. And we were working with it, and now we were the first one to take the discussions out in, in the plen plenary. So now we, we were first out, everyone was listening, it was completely different. And the things we tried to do with the uh, LRF, for example, in the ETS, in the first period, I had to kind of drag every percentage out of the other institutions. In the second, it was like, OK, we give you the double. Would you like some more? Yeah, we, we give it to you. So it was quite um, a, a game change, uh, I would like to say. But uh, now I would like the other gentleman to take the floor. And I will I'll follow up with a question. Actually, yeah, before. thank you. <laughs> no. So now you're back in the Swedish, uh, in Swedish politics. Yes. So how? How can you explain or can you understand why it seems so difficult for the policy discussion in Sweden and I think also in the other Nordic countries to take in what's happening at the, at the European level and maybe also accept that you know, the policies that are decided there affect climate policy at home? Yeah, it's, for me it feels like I'm back in 2014 again. Uh, so for me it's like the circle is... Um, is uh, has gone the whole way back. Uh, so for me, it's quite a shock actually this year. Uh, coming back, hearing people talking like the Fit for 55 doesn't exist or 
as if it's going to be presented now, it's already decided, almost all of it. And uh, now, it is, now it has to do with the implementation, how to do the work. That's where the discussion should be. What tools should we use to do what's said in Fit for 55? That should be the focus. Instead, it's like people are waking up and saying, oh, something, something is talked about in Brussels. Maybe we should engage ourselves. And I find that frustrating because we were some people trying to get the attention and I think we got some attention too, but obviously something was missing because I feel in the public debate, it's like uh, one is speaking about the, uh, the Swedish climate law and not about uh, Fit for 55. And if we talk about it, it's like it is, um, uh, there is a, a, a kind of a choice here, like maybe we could choose something else. Sorry, that train has already passed. Now it's about how to do it. And we could, and hopefully we will talk about the democratic aspects of this, having the debate about proposals too late. That's not a good idea uh, if we would like to engage people. Thank you. Thank you. Pat? <laughs> <clears throat> Happy to be here. Hi, everybody. Um, so, are we forerunners is one of the questions posed to us by the organizers. And I think it's fair to say that the Scandinavian countries has, in some respect, been forerunners in the sense that we have helped commercialization of new technologies, sometimes together with others. Norway played an essential role with battery electric vehicle vehicles, but together with parts of China, California and others uh, that created the volumes needed in order to, do, to, to cut costs. And I think it's also fair to say that Denmark played a similar role with the commercialization of wind uh, power back uh, 20 years ago. And Sweden maybe could claim that we, by replacing electric radiators, provided a new market for very efficient heat pumps 25 years ago. We may recall also the much criticized German Energiewende and its feed-in tariffs, which played an essential role for providing volumes for the market of um, uh, solar cells to the um, benefit of the entire world, and particularly to China, which exported these things to, to uh, Germany and, and uh, the rest of Europe. Um, but we can also see that the um, ambitious national am goals that has been decided, for instance, in Sweden and Norway, are far from being achieved. There is a very noticeable gap between um, goals and tools. Uh, we can see the, the um, idea in Sweden of cutting domestic transport emissions by 70% until 2030 was based on the assumption that traffic volumes could easily be reduced rather than continuing to rise. And on a very ambitious biofuel obligation, which is currently based to 85% on imported bioenergy. I don't think we can claim to be a true forerunner based on, on that experience. The, 50, the Fit for 55 package has reduced the gap between national ambitions in the most ambitious countries and the EU. And I have difficulties seeing that if we were to reach the long-term goal five years ahead of the EU, that that would provide incentives that would contribute substantially to the advancement of new technologies that could be widely um, used across Europe and the world compared to uh, moving at the same uh, speed as the rest of Europe. So I think that that time lies behind us. But it's also interesting to note that in two respects, we need to become or to stay forerunners because we have agreed to do more than others in two respects. One is the um, uh, Lulu S uh, CF regulation, forestry and land use, uh, which uh, Svante Mandels and others' uh, contribution highlighted, but they didn't go into the details of how the incentive is going to be provided to 
landowners and to forest industry. That is something that Sweden needs to and other countries needs to, to start working on. Um, and of course, that uh, what we need to do is related to the, the feasibility of uh, increasing the, the carbon sink. Sweden has 65% forest land, so of course, we need to do more than some others. The other um, area is the um, uh, SCR regulation, which you touched upon in several of the, or, or both introductions, uh, where Sweden, to my um, surprise, has agreed to cut its emissions by 50% in 2030 compared to 2005, despite the fact that in 2005, heating made up only 8% of those emissions, which is much, much less than all the other countries. And transport made up around 50%. It still is 50% of the remaining emissions from the Swedish ECR sector. And that means, of course, that we will have to face a higher marginal abatement cost compared to most other countries. And then it's interesting to see whether it would be feasible to trade with others but we don't really know whether there will be, be a market for those quotas or whether bilateral agreements with other countries will be the only way of doing it. And we don't even know how many other countries with lower um, targets will be overachieving them. So this is a tricky matter to, to uh, understand. And that makes me think that we will have to at least temporary use subsidies to some degree. We will have to uh, do what John highlighted in his comment when you read this thick volume, it ends with some comments by John saying that it's essential to streamline permission processes for green infrastructure and I might add for manufacturing. And we might have to go further than countries that has to do less in the transport sector compared to what we must achieve. In particularly when it comes to, to um, uh, charging infrastructure. And of course, he also highlights the, ne the need for the necessary competences and manpower to become available. And I think that is a real challenge. Um, I think it, it, we will have good use of the um, more stringent carbon emission standards for new vehicles. But we also need to be better than the average country in terms of, of uh, buying them. And that leads me to the idea that for some years we have to provide some kind of incentive, particularly on heavy um, duty trucks, where the cost gap is still considerable uh, compared to diesel engines. Um, Svante and his colleagues uh, proposed the development of a um, market for, for carbon dioxide, which would make it less necessary to use all these other supplementary uh, instruments. And I agree in principle. I actually, close to 20 years ago, was mandated by the Swedish government to provide an assessment of the feasibility of expanding the um, carbon uh, trade to the transport sector, which I felt was a good idea already then, but it hasn't happened. And the problem with your academic approach is that if you try to make politics out of it, it's going to take at least three, four, five years, uh, including assessments, uh, public hearings, um, proposal, a bill by the government, and some time for uh, citizens and industry to, to adjust to, to new rules. So I think that we need to rely on second best solutions at least up to say 2028 or, or something like that, which means that a large part of the EC air peri period will have to rely on instruments that we already have. We need to, to, to make them better, which I think can be done by, by relatively fast decisions in part by parliament, but to replace them by something much better would take something like five years and might be important in the longer run, but not for 2030. And we also need to remember that the ECR commitment applies to every single year from now and to 2030 and beyond. 
So we cannot wait for years in order to replace current uh, national legislations by better ones. I think I stopped there. I follow up with a question to you too. So, so um, you were quite critical against the transport sector target in Sweden, as, and for you who are every Swede knows about the transport sector target, I guess. But for those of you who are not Swedish, it says that we have to reduce uh, emissions within the Swedish transportation sector by seventy percent uh, to twenty thirty. And you you were critical about that when it was set. Uh, how has your and, and you remain critical, as I understand. How has your kind of view on it, has it changed, or is it the same argument as before? I think that the position that I took already when this was not said, <laughs> that the position that I took uh, 10 years ago when this was first investigated was that it was uh, not possible without extremely high taxes on road fuels to depress uh, demand for road transport to the extent that that committee thought possible. Uh, by government seemed to, to agree with what the committee said and relied on uh, reducing traffic to an extent which I felt was completely unrealistic. I was also rather critical on the um, high quantities of biofuel to be used in the Swedish transport sector because that is nothing that other countries could do because we would all become net importers of, of bioenergy and it seems to me rather strange that a country with 65% of its land covered by forests should rely on a large percentage of net import. So uh, I think I've stayed with the analysis that I made 10 years ago it seems relevant to me uh, today. I haven't really changed my mind. Vad var det jag sa som svenska säger? Ja. Svante? Or did you want to, you can come in now if thank, you want. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say on the ETS proposal for the transport sector that I do think it's going to happen. Uh, but I, I also agree that it's not a quick fix, but it, it's, it's not going to be the Swedish only uh, to have a, a market for that. It's going to be for the whole European Union. And actually, the, both the, the Council and the, the Parliament has said yes to it. But it's, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, uh, it's going to be lots of things that needs to happen before. Uh, like there is going to be, uh, uh, they have to analyze how the energy prices are. It's going to be later uh, in this uh, decade, so it's going to be closer to, to 2030. But still, even the European Parliament said yes. Uh, so that's, uh, it, once again, we have proposals on the EU level that is taking place, but the member states speak as if they are creating something on their own. Uh, but this this is going to happen, I'm quite sure of it, since we have the decisions. Uh, but then when and how and how many obstacles around it and how strong it's going to be, that will be, that is something that I think can still change. Uh, but, but that there is in the current ETS uh, amendments about uh, having an ETS for the transport sector, that has been agreed. Uh, but how how it will look, how how the price signal will be, how strong it will be, everything around that is still up to kind of discussion. Uh, we'd like to put a question to you on yeah. that particular matter because yeah. uh, the ETS BRT, as it is called, uh, which is supposed to be uh, up running in 2027 or 2028, it provides an option for member states to opt out, not to participate, provided that the country in question has a carbon tax which matches the price level of the on the ETS too. Yeah. But then, could Sweden argue that we have this? Because what we did in road transport was just relabeling part of the existing diesel and uh, petrol tax, calling part of it energy tax and the other part carbon tax. In my view, in order to be able to use the opt-out option, the Swedish fuel tax on diesel and gasoline need to, uh, the, the, the part that we call energy tax should uh, match the price 
uh, on uh, Im on um, photos on on the new ETS. Otherwise, we would be cheating. Yes, as I but understand that it, is, that is not really It's not part of the regulation. I, d I cannot see how the EU has intend or intends to to to, uh, to tackle this. Me neither. Uh, I think that was uh, uh, the on the on the trialogue now. That was uh, a discussion, uh, and uh, to to kind of read that, uh, maybe you have to to be in that uh, room. Uh, but uh, for sure, next after uh, the election next year. Um, I believe the next parliament will work on how how to to kind of do this revision. Um, but it's it's on the table, and the will from the member states are there. And then how and how this opt out will look. I think that's to the next next trialogue to to figure out or the next revision. That's how I read it. But uh, for sure, it's the people who was in that room who maybe know exactly how they were thinking. Okay, thank you. Svante yeah. is standing on his toes. He wants to come in. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Uh, I could talk for hours about the new ETS, but I, yeah. I'll, I'll, I won't do that. You already heard me for 30 minutes. I'll keep this brief. Uh, I've been doing research on, on climate policy since 2001 or something horrible like that, and seen policies come and go. Uh, most of it is actually impressively good. Uh, if we look at Sweden, Almost all CO2 emissions have a price tag. And we know that that is the best way, the most efficient way to decrease the emissions. Uh, and we should be very, very proud of that. We, uh, I think it was 1991 when we introduced the CO2 tax. Right? That was on the committee. Excellent. <laughs> Good work. Um, he has done everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, and the emissions are going down. The, uh, as you say, we basically have no individual fossil-based uh, heating anymore in Sweden. Don't even good, uh, should be proud about that. Looking at the EU, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. I mean, we got we had the pandemics, we got a war in Ukraine, we got inflation, which is just uh, bizarre, and we still manage to push Fit for 55 through. Which is uh, 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 and it's extremely um, strengthening the the the, uh, the the emissions will be reduced extremely compared to before Fit for 55. So we uh, so Sweden a lot of good policies, some less good. EU impressive. What's a bit weird is that when you stand in Sweden, we seem to just ignore the EU. And that is strange. I think I think I stop there. Yeah. And this is what me and John spoke about ahead of this uh, uh, seminar. Uh, that we have a, a, a quite. A, um, special situation here where sweden is a front runner in many ways doing good as uh, both of you pointed out and many people have been involved in that work and now we also have uh, we are picking the the cherries from that work and uh, the industry is really well going and many companies in this country is, uh, is front runners in uh, in different areas then we have a legislation that is ambitious on the EU level, but there is some kind of gap when we speak about it now. So uh, in the public debate in Sweden, we speak about what's done in Sweden and the Swedish climate law, but we don't speak about uh, how it's, it's fitting with the EU Fit for 55 and the whole climate package there and the climate law on the EU level. And I think the problem, there are many problems because uh, we, we, we need to also implement that and kind of um, make it uh, as a puzzle function together, uh, focus on the right um, areas uh, and and don't get stuck in all debates but actually focus on how we do for innovation education um, the the skills among the the labor force uh, make sure that um, the that the businesses have the the right kind of setting for doing the work together i think that's where the climate debate should be in sweden now but we still talk about targets and our what we have done uh, a while ago, 
and I also find it a democratic problem that that people believe that they can change things that is not up for revision now and probably when it's up for revision people will not be aware that now it's the time to do it because it will be times again to to be involved so i think we need to kind of match uh, the debate with the revisions that's a bit uh, what the focus should be okay i think i'd like to come back to something which i brought up uh, in response to to your presentation earlier on and that is the uh, enormous amount of electricity that will be used in the transformation which is not discussed much in this volume except for in the contribution from finland uh, which brings up the issue of whether it is enough with electricity only markets or whether it should be supplemented by some kind of capacity mechanisms, and you could also bring up different types of demand side management tools in order to make it possible to rely so heavily on intermittent uh, electricity production from, from wind in particular. And I think this is very essential in the sense that if we miss a little bit of our time schedule, and we don't really know what the lead times will be because this involves also the entire distribution network uh, in our country and in neighboring countries, we will run into difficulties. Electricity, fossil free electricity is an enormous resource, potentially much, much larger than um, uh, biofuels or bioenergy. So it's very important that we can rely on having access to the, this electricity when we need it. And that is not much discussed in the volume. So if I would like to give you some idea for future work in the Nordic context, it might be to look more closely on the electricity markets. Jutta? I absolutely see that. And I hopefully the government see it too, uh, that this is, this is a big, big part of, of uh, what needs to be done. And um, to, to be able to have the infrastructure is one part of it uh, and make sure that um, we do that, that it's, as I understand, Norway is really ahead here and doing a lot, uh, but we need to have it all of Sweden too and make sure that people can rely on it. But um, I do see, and I understood in the first panel that you spoke about the biofuels and the blending and the discussion there. But I do think that we need to see, as been pointed out in the Swedish radio today, uh, that there are many old uh, cars also still on the streets and uh, they also need to, to, um, to be part of this. And, uh, it, it will be more difficult if that old fleet is not also transformed uh, in some way. So I would like to hear a little bit on that part, why uh, in the first panel you had a lot of discussions on this, but for me, electrification is the big kind of the lion part. Uh, if you look at the, the uh, uh, 2050 for you for Europe or for EU and also our own target in Sweden that's the big that's the lion part but we also need to do something about the old fleet Fante, you, I think yeah. you have also analyzed the consequences of scrapping premiums for example for old cars so but uh, you yeah. answer yeah. whatever you want so if we start with electrification of course is needed for other stuff than, than just yeah, transport. The transport. But, but it will probably uh, play a, a, a major role there. Uh, the idea we had, I think, was that the the um, the biofuels should be used to sort of bridge that gap until the more or less the entire fleet will be electric by 2040-ish, um, 2035 or something like that. I don't know, but you, you you definitely have a point. I mean, we could we could go for 100% electrification in the in the new fleet. But we still won't reach minus 70 because we have old cars. And if, if, uh, if they emit a lot of fossil uh, CO2, well, we, we have to do something else. And, and Denmark, for example, don't need to do that because they can phase out, uh, phase out natural gas in heating. 
Is yeah. that the case? Yeah. yeah. Mm. But we could trade it if yeah. we adjust the price. And then you th I think that we eventually will need some kind of a scrapping scheme, but not necessarily in the near time. And I think <coughs> it will become even more evident that it's needed uh, when it comes to motorized machinery or, or mobile, mm -hmm. mobile machinery. Uh, agriculture tractors, for instance, they tend to become pretty old. Mm -hmm. And so we need to replace also in, in that sector. Uh, but my concern with electricity is not primarily with providing enough electricity for uh, the road transport sector. It's the industrial transformation which will require even more. And I think it was interesting to take part in, in um, Michael Huell's uh, part of the report, which you also uh, touched upon carbon capture and storage and how a market for carbon capture and storage in, in what time frame could that develop? Because I think we need to move on simultaneously on, on different routes because the time is so short. Um, I think I'll stop there. Jutta? Um, I do think, and I think on the EU level, one has good uh, ho um, hopes for uh, bio CCS, bio CCU as being um, complementary and important. Uh, but but we we do need to reduce emissions in a, in a big scale also and make sure that is happening without having very unequal societies and lots of social tensions so i think and i think also the message from the eu commission is that one needs many different political tools. It cannot be all the eggs in one basket. Uh, yes, electrification is a very big part of it, but still uh, one needs to also help uh, help different sectors with uh, also other tools. And when I think about the, 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 the private cars, um, one, one talks about that they live for seven, 17 years and people still buy them um, and they are uh, uh, even though the swedish companies see that electrification is is it and they will completely change to that uh, there will be many years where we still uh, people buy the the, the the gasoline cars or uh, diesel cars even. And uh, therefore, I think it's important that there is a system to help out there. So I'm, I'm a bit worried about the new proposal from, from the government here. Uh, but yet, if there are other good ideas on how to do it, how to help the, the, the transport uh, and the, especially the the cars to to emit less. Uh, I would be very eager to listen to it. Uh, but we need, I think, we need some more uh, tools. That's uh, and I think in the climate debate is always like this. One all people likes to find one tool, the magic trick that would be so helpful for everything. I don't think it's like that. I think it's like uh, uh, when you work with uh, building a society, you, you need to have very me different measures. There is not one magic tool. If, if you like to create a society that's safe, equal for people or, or uh, equal opportunities, if that's your t goal, like in my party, that's very big, uh, the master plan, <laughs> that's it's not easy. You cannot do it by only having good school system or only good uh, buildings and homes for people. You cannot do it with only having the tool of having a, a labor market that's uh, fair for everyone and good salaries. You need all of it. That's the trick. And I think in climate, we need to be more like that. We cannot see that it's only that sector, it's only that tool, it's only, it's about chasing the emissions everywhere. And then during the way, we will do some mistakes. We will do some things that's a little bit too expensive, a little bit less efficient than we thought, but together we are building this new, more sustainable uh, system and society. Okay, Annika tells me that I have to let you also take an opportunity to ask questions to the panel here. So she is uh, ready with the microphone. Mikael. Yeah, I have a quick question. We were talking about uh, it takes a long time to get the whole uh, uh, fleet of cars electrified. And we had to come up with something earlier. Has there been any discussion of so-called e-fuels? That is, you can make artificially gasoline or diesel <coughs> using water and air. 
plus a lot of elect electricity. Uh, so it's a very inefficient electricity use, in a sense. But on the other hand, you can just use this ex ex existing fleet of cars can go on that uh, artificial gasoline. Is that something that has been discussed in Sweden? Anyone? Gitta? Or Maybe or bad, uh, bad? you would like, I can also um, add. Yeah. It is being discussed primarily as a fuel for aviation. Uh, but it's true that as a last resort, you could rely on it also for fueling up old uh, gasoline cars or, or diesel co engines, but at a very high cost. Uh, so I think that we should want to, to avoid it as much as we can. Old cars, and as I understand it, also new porches, because they want to hear the sound. The owners of porches want to hear the sound of a... Of a uh, explosive uh, auto engine. Uh, any more questions? There in the back, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering, I mean, for me, it seems that um, in general, maybe the, uh, according to like standard economic theory, the most efficient way to reduce the emissions is to have like a single CO2 price for all sectors, and for all countries and so on um, and maybe if there are like you know certain industries that you know you need to like help them grow initially then you can have some maybe there's place for subsidies and special regulations um, but then when I think of uh, uh, I mean uh, for example repower EU and fit for 55 I think there is there's a lot of very detailed regulations and targets for specific sectors, like, um, um, I don't know, requiring buildings to have solar panels or requiring a certain part of the building stock to be renovated. And there's targets for, uh, you know, producing certain amount of green hydrogen, uh, biofuels and so on. Um, and I think also when we, if we look at like national policies, there's a lot of specific um, policies such as, okay, in Sweden we have the specific target for the transportation sector. Uh, in Norway, um, they want to electrify oil platforms, which for me doesn't make much sense because I think if you use less oil on the platform, this oil is just being exported somewhere else and burnt there. Um, so what I'm wondering is kind of, do you think that, um, do you think that we need all these specific, um, policies or do you think that they are, uh, a problem? Because what I kind of fear is that, um, yeah, th there will be some policies that can maybe be problematic for certain countries and that then um, this can kind of decrease the legitimacy for general climate policy and so on. Good. Uh, many policies are needed, yes. but are we doing too much? I, I think it was a little bit directed also to, uh, to, to, <laughs> to the people who worked with the legislation. And I have been there working with climate law and ETS and some of the other proposals too in, in Fit for 55. Um, I, I do two answers very quick. First, yes, the best thing would be to have a CO2 tax that would be global and work for everyone and would steer in a predictable way all businesses in the right direction. That would be absolutely the best tool. But there is no political way we can do that in uh, fast enough. Uh, I'm, I'm sure of that too, since I've seen the discussions on the global level in all these COP uh, that has been going on the last uh, decade. I know that that is the long run. Uh, we can fight for it, we can try, we can see if, if there is a magic uh, opening uh, somewhere, but I think we need to work meanwhile with different legislation that is um, going into each other like a puzzle and hopefully also make 
market-based ETS systems that will work globally and that more and more countries will add their own ETS system into our ETS system. That's the best tool. And to make the ETS also for the transport sector on the, on the EU level, I think these, these measures are the closest we will get. And on the, the other response is on the detail level. That has been many times a frustration. Uh, many times also there are industries lobbying very strong for their technology and they have tight link to the to the EU Commission that is proposing. And if sometimes if you ask why is it so important to have exactly that measure, like um, uh, smart meters in every building uh, to measure the energy level. That's a good thing, yes, but maybe it doesn't work in Sweden. In Sweden, we have other way of um, cooperating on the on the heating system. Uh, so for us, that would be a very expensive extra cost. We could do more with isolation, uh, with the windows, with other things. Why should why do we need to use exactly that technology? Uh, and then there is often an answer in Germany or somewhere. Mm. <laughs> like, oh, we like that. Uh, okay, but uh, it doesn't fit for us. So, yes, you're absolutely right. We, we need to fight to be too detailed and give more the, the direction and say, as technology neutral as possible. Then there are some technologies that's fossil based and they, there we are not. Um, neutral but we need to we need to work more with a target and a direction from the eu level one very short question from the from the back there we are a little bit over time so i have to be short very short question for you do you think the arguments for rethinking or changing the national uh, targets are good enough to seriously consider it i think as I see it, uh, I, I think uh, uh, no. I don't. I, I I see that they still have a valid steering. Um, they they are steering in a good direction for Sweden, and I also think they are very. They they have a strong in the parliament. There has a strong kind of link to the work that people have done, and democratically, I think it's really important. Uh, I do think that the EU level is catching up and I do think that that will also be scaled up uh, in the future and there will be some snowball effects on the EU legislation. Uh, so there will be some moments where maybe EU will actually go faster than maybe some Swedish uh, points in the in Swedish uh, climate law. So that will maybe be a discussion then, but uh, no, still, I think it's guiding, guiding the Sweden to, to go a little bit faster, yes, but many times also winning from that. Thank you very much. That was the final word on this issue today, but I don't think it's going to be the final word uh, in general. And I hope that we're going to discuss these things much more uh, academically in the policy discussion in all the Nordic countries. So I thank the panel very much for being here, and I thank the audience and all the authors on behalf of me and Harry. Thank you. Thanks.